So let's have a look at what Reverend Melville said. We cannot live only for ourselves. A thousand fibers connect us with one another. And along these fibers, as sympathetic threads, our actions run as causes and they come back to us as effects. I need to start off this evening with acknowledgements because each of you sitting here has in some way been part of that interconnectedness. In some way, somewhere along the line, have been part of the threads that have influenced my journey to here. Um, Julia very kindly welcomed um, my family, and I'll perhaps get back to them right at the end. Um, but I really wanted to say thank you to all the colleagues who are here, in particular uh, my colleagues from the Centre for Health Professions Education. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here. I know you're excited as I am, so thank you for staying late. In particular, I wanted to say thank you to Edward Dean Marie. Edward Dean is my right hand and my left hand, and it's been quite a roller coaster the past couple of weeks. I've been ill, I've been away, um, so thank you, Dean, for everything. Also, to the students who are here, um, Christina Tan, who is going to be doing her oral tomorrow for her PhD, all the way from Malaysia. Christina, it's lovely to have you here as well. Um, and then, obviously, to all my colleagues um, from Stellenbosch side, my former colleagues from the Centre for Teaching and Learning, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Nicoline, it's been a long journey. I don't know where Nicoline is now. There you go. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you here. Um, this is a wonderful place to work. I have been here now for seven years, and I want to just say to the management of this faculty, thank you. Thank you for your support. Jimmy is my real boss, and uh, even though Julia makes as if she's my boss, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but thank you very much. Um, thank you for all being here this evening. Um, I also want to thank a lot of friends who are here, uh, people who come from way back. Um, Georgia is sitting there with the bright, bright pink shirt. And uh, Georgia was the person who took a chance on me when I was a single mother. Oh, not a single mother. <laughs> Sorry, Tiny. <laughs> When I was a young mother, I never was a single mother. <laughs> when I was a young mother who only wanted to work half day and had been out of the work environment for about eight, nine years, and nobody wanted to give me a job, and Georgia took a chance on me, and I started off as her administrative assistant. And Georgia, it's been a long journey, but wonderful to have you here this evening. Also wanted to especially welcome Rena Williamson, uh, Rena was my first academic colleague, and the first day I walked into her office, she showed me her filing cabinet. That was in the days when we um, didn't have PowerPoint. And she said to me, there are all my transparencies, all, my, all the classes are worked out, we were going to be teaching the same subject. She said, take whatever you need, use whatever you need. And Rena, that got me going. I learned a lot about teaching and learning from you, so thank you for coming this evening. Um, I also want to acknowledge Brenda Libovitz, who was uh, the director at the Centre for Teaching and Learning, who can't be here this evening, and Professor Eli Bitzer, who was my PhD and my master's supervisor, who's in Australia at the moment. And then I need to talk about Mariki de Villiers. So Mariki was the vice dean or the deputy dean teaching at the time in 2010, we sat next to each other in a Committee for Learning and Teaching meeting, and I said to her, I think it's time to, that I make a change. And she looked at me and she said, well, why don't you come and work at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences? And Mariki, thank you so much. Um, I owe you a debt of gratitude I don't think I'll easily repay. Uh, it's been wonderful, and thank you. I'd also like to um, just at this point say thank you to um, Julia and Cecilia and Eli in his absence for helping me work through 
the um, talk that I'm going to be presenting this evening, thank you very much for that. And then Julia, also just on a personal note, um, I greatly appreciate your support and your wisdom and your friendship. The colleagues who are here from, from further afield, I particularly want to thank Francois, I don't know where Francois is sitting, um, there he is. Francois, thank you for coming. Um, Francois has been a long time colleague and he was also the co-author of that Amy Guide that um, Jimmy was telling you about. So finally, um, before we get going, my, my deepest gratitude to my family. The Van Skolkvaks are an interesting bunch and there's a whole lot of us here. Um, but the Van Skolkvaks, uh, I remember the night before I got married, my mother said to me, you realize you're not just marrying Tiny, you're marrying a clan. <laughs> and she was right. Um, it's a wonderful clan to be in. Margareta, Christian, Wilhelmine, Sharon, thank you all for being here. Um, and then also to friends from many years, I think Scotty and Elsha I saw coming in, um, and then also um, Ian and, and Judy, thanks for, thanks for being here. And then finally, of course, to, to Jenny, who's standing at the back with little Oliver, and Rehart, to Nana and Tiny. Okay. I think let's give all of you a round of applause before we go. So that gives me just a chance to give my birth and let's get going. On borders, boundaries and being a chameleon, I'm going to share some metaphors for perhaps reframing the academic project. It's quite a mouthful. Uh, I hope it's going to get clearer as I go along. And I'd like to start off by suggesting that, sorry, academia is a very strange place. For those who look in from the outside at the way we do things, probably often quite perplexed. And this strangeness, this way of doing, is something that we in academia have perpetuated for decades, even centuries. It's personified in the way we do things. It's personified in the, our rituals and practices, the things we value and the things we hold dear. It defines who we are and what we do. That definition has particular relevance at this time of instability and uncertainty in South Africa, and particularly in South African higher education. Because this strangeness has implications for what I've called the academic project. And in using that term, I've borrowed from a very dear colleague from Rhodes, Professor Sue McKenna. The academic project is, is about the teaching that we practice and the learning that occurs and the research that we undertake. And the strangeness has implications for all of that. And we need to ask questions about our practices, our ways of doing, and ask whether these might in some way be contributing to the status quo that we currently see in higher education. We also need to ask questions about how we as academics can use our very considerable influence to chart a different way forward. And so that's what I'm hoping we will think about this evening. These are quite weighty issues, they're quite complex issues, and probably too weighty and too complex for this evening's talk. But I did think that they're significant enough for us to perhaps just tease out some of the threads that hold together these conversations. Perhaps unravel some threads relating to issues of access and how our students participate in higher education. Issues of learning and meaning making, and how we come to know, and inevitably issues of power and social justice, and what that means for us. So to do so, I'm hoping to draw on ideas and understandings that have emerged from my own work um, as both a teacher and a researcher in academia in this strange place over the past 20 odd years. So why borders and boundaries? Why did I bring those into my title? 
I think it's important that we first look at some definitional issues. Those of you who know me will know that I love to start my workshops with, let's first get on the same page. And the trouble is that when we start thinking about academia, which we could define as an environment or community concerned with the pursuit of education, scholarship and community engagement, the trouble is that it's not really that straightforward. You could start thinking about academia with a sort of capital A or in capital letters that overarching community. But then there's also academia perhaps with a small a. And so the sub-communities that exist within that larger community are disciplines, are professions. So you could argue that academia is something like a federation of states made up of all these different disciplines. And each one is vying for legitimacy, claiming for themselves a set of values, a set of norms. Um, and of course, this can pot um, uh, potentially become a lot more complex because in this Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, for example, we have probably a consortium of disciplines, some of which intersect, some of which don't. Barnett has argued that the fields or these states have been built up over time through communities and have an underpinning in a research literature, identifiable, identifiable in having their own key concepts, truth and criteria in their own reason and judgment. So their own way of making sense of things. And these fields produce that measure of strangeness that I started off with. The strangeness offers perspectives that for the outside world would not necessarily be available. Now if you wish to belong to academia, to be a member of the epistemic community, you typically need to subscribe to the truths of that community. <laughs> for those seeking entry into the community, such as our students, but also young lecturers coming in, new academics, citizenship is going to be reliant on the extent to which you can effectively engage within the state. If you wish to become a member of the community, you will need to own the strangeness and subscribe to the truths it holds dear. So now we come to borders and boundaries because ideas of community, citizenship, states, federation, these all imply borders. In the context of academia, borders are important because they maintain the integrity of what's within. They hold the integrity of the discipline together. They define what constitutes, as, constitutes knowledge and knowing within that discipline. Trouble is, of course, that borders can also exclude and alienate. Boundaries create insiders, but they also create outsiders. They not only define who belongs, but they also define who does not. So this idea of alienation, being an outsider, was taken up in Jonathan Janssen's most recent book, As By Fire. And Bronwyn, thank you. I don't know where you're sitting, but thank you for giving me this book. Um, in his book, Jonathan talks about the root cause of the crisis number one as being financial exclusion. But the thing that he calls root cause number two is the notion of cultural alienation. And I think his chapter on this topic speaks to where I'm going today. He speaks to mo the physical monuments of the past and the memories that we carry with us because of the past. He explores issues of symbols and class and of language and the potential of these things to alienate and the fact that they have inherent power. Janssen's work is known to many of you in this room, I know, and he's often regarded as controversial or even disruptive, but I believe his focus on cultural alienation is an important one for our discussion on borders. So let's think a little bit about alienation and its nemesis, engagement. A couple of years ago, Jenny Case from UCT explored the idea of alienation and engagement with a group of undergraduate engineering students. And she argued that alienation is the absence of the sort of relationships that students might have wished to have had or even expected to have had. And the idea of engagement is 
a, a learning experience that is facilitated through the building of relationships. And these ideas of alienation engagement have been taken further even within our own faculty by Beside Notes, Celia and other colleagues, where they looked at what this would mean at postgraduate level. And my focus across this talk will very much be situated in the postgraduate space. So perhaps hold that for a while as we move along. And relationships in that context are then key. But relationships, building relationships, assumes fair playing fields and rules that are transparent. It assumes that our students can belong within that knowledge community that I was describing earlier. So what does it mean to belong within the border? And here I've drawn on the work of Etienne Wenger um, and his idea of communities of practice. And his work actually originated outside of academia, but has been taken up very strongly um, in teaching and learning across the world and has relevance here as well. Um, Wenger's work specifically on social learning system um, introduced the notion of competence in a community. So to, be, to belong within a community, you need to be competent within that community, says Wenger. But competence, he says, is about understanding the enterprise, the project, well enough to be able to contribute it. And also to be able to engage with the community as a trusted partner, to have access to what he describes as a shared repertoire. We could argue a shared language and to be able to use that appropriately. So members have a joint, share a joint enterprise, and belonging, says Wenger, is enabled in three ways. Through engagement, to actively being part of the, the community, through imagination, which is just such an amazing concept. The idea that we need to envisage ourselves as being within that disciplinary space. How important is that for our postgraduate students? And then finally, says Wenger, it's about alignment. It's not about the newcomer entering the disciplinary space and being absorbed into it and, and accepting unchallenged the canon that exists there. It's rather about aligning the thinking of what, he, of what is within the disciplinary community and what the newcomer be it the postgraduate student or the new academic, what they bring into this disciplinary space. So I've argued that these are exciting concepts because they offer us insights as to how academia can move forward. Essentially, belonging implies what Wenger describes as legitimate participation. So it could be argued that while borders and boundaries separate, the exciting thing is that they also are there to be crossed. So they give us opportunities, they give our students opportunities to go forth and to explore. And if we start thinking about borders and boundaries in the context of our postgraduate students, then we're seeing entry into a disciplinary space. But others have written, um, including Judy, Julie Klein, crossing boundaries in the context of interdisciplinarity and interprofessionality. And that has a lot of resonance in our own faculty. So there, it's an intricate matrix of the different ways in which people are moving and crossing boundaries. In the context of a community of practice, conceptually, boundary crosser, a boundary crosser, crossing or border crossing creates a, a space that is potentially uh, productive, creates opportunities for us to learn and grow with one another, learn from one another, but it also involves a considerable amount of risk. And it's also about identity work as, as one shifts and finds ways in which to make sense of the different ways of doing from one disciplinary space to the next. It also has implications for our students, our postgraduate students. And um, those of you who know me well, who've worked with me, will know that a lot of my focus is with postgraduate and particularly um, doctoral students. And I've 
found it fascinating to understand the way in which they navigate these academic journeys, the way in which they transition into their chosen disciplinary community, and the way in which they construct an academic identity. But doing that, crossing borders, can be particularly difficult. And that's where we're going next. Our students being, our postgraduate students being, therefore, within a particular discipline, is inescapably intertwined with the extent of their knowing within that discipline. So the question is, how, does, how, how do we facilitate that knowing? Because knowing facilitates membership. And that knowing will give students the confidence that they can put their hands on their hips, Christina, Debbie, Anka, you know what I'm talking about, Mariette, there are quite a number of you from the PhD group here. Putting your hands on your hips, says Barbara Kamla and Pat Thompson, means that they have something worth saying. And having, worth say, having something worth saying is implicit in postgraduate endeavours. It signals an arrival, a specific milestone in one's academic journey. The challenge is that the way in which that scholarship, that something worth saying is typically demonstrated, is in the written text. And these texts have to stand up to the scrutiny of peers, peers who represent what is worth saying. So the published text has become the currency in which academia trades. It's what, the way in which we demonstrate our scholarliness. And I would argue that writing, therefore, is high stakes for all of us, not only our students. So if we think about writing as a currency, um, a couple of years ago, in fact last year it was published, but I wrote this a few years ago, the idea that language then holds a powerful symbolic presence, particularly in South Africa. And language is obviously the tool for the writing. And this symbolic presence is across the many strata of our culturally rich yet unequal society. And it represents both freedom and oppression, depending on which language and who is speaking. In the context of higher education, language becomes a weapon of powerful knowledge. It can serve to subjugate and exclude. And there's therefore an ideological dimension to what it means um, to have the requisite literacies, languages, in a particular discipline. So James G has conducted seminal work in this field and he's suggested that your academic literacies comprise socially recognizable activities. So the way in which you write also gives you entry into the disciplinary community. It gives you a mantra that suggests that you belong, or a, 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 a cape, a, something that you can pull on. And, and, and um, he carries on and suggests that a discourse is a sort of identity kit, which comes complete with the appropriate costume and instructions on how to act, talk, and write, so that you take on a particular social role that others will recognize. So you see this idea of belonging and being within the disciplinary community has, has um, implications for the way in which our students not only think, but also write. And engaging legitimately, then, in the discipline will require you as a student to have the sort of academic literacies, knowledge and understanding of the values, norms, and conventions that define that discipline. And um, in this section, I draw very strongly on the work of Cecilia Jacobs, who's with us today. Thank you, Cecilia. So essentially, Bartholomew has argued that when students engage with academic writing, they have to invent the university for the occasion. Let's think about what that might mean, event, inventing the university for the occasion. Let's take a bit of a segue now, because I need to just take a bit of a breath, and this is a time moment for me, so I'm going to have another sip of water. 
Okay, why the chameleon then? I've spoken about the borders and boundaries, but where does the idea of the chameleon come from? So you heard earlier that I moved from a center for teaching and learning into this faculty of medicine and health sciences. And in doing that, I really crossed quite a significant disciplinary boundary. And that had huge implications for the way in which I practiced my craft. And a couple of years ago, a colleague from UWC, who has since passed away, Wendy Macmillan, Wendy and I sat together, she was working at, um, in the dentistry faculty at the time in a very similar position to the one I hold here in the um, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And we talked about how it was to move from a teaching and learning space into a Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And we conducted what is known as a duo ethnography. And in that work, we identified ourselves as having a chameleon-like existence, as we spent a bit of time on the one side of the border and then moved across into the other side of the border. And what that meant for the way in which we had to reframe our thinking and choose different words. And even this evening as I'm speaking, some of you who really draw on the biomedical sciences um, or see the biomedical sciences as your home, Nico, might be wondering, what is she on about? Because I'm really doing the chameleon thing right here. Um, in our study, we drew on the work of uh, Pukukonis and others who use slightly different language to the language of Wenger and Guy, but emphasize the cultural practices and, that are characterized by a common set of symbols, values, customs, even dress. Um, Wendy once said to me, she, she always is aware of the fact that she's working with dentists and always feels that she must dress very smartly. I'm not sure, I don't have that sense with, in this faculty, but okay. So it's become axiomatic to talk about the need for interdisciplinary approaches um, to respond to the complex problems besetting this world. And it was it was that that had Wendy and I thinking about how one negotiates moving across these disciplines. And for us in the Center for Health Professions Education, this has particular relevance because most of our MPhil and PhD students are in their first lives um, healthcare practitioners across the whole spectrum of different professions. And now they are introduced into a totally different world when they embark on their studies in health professions education. This shifting suggests that for many of us, we might need to start living or adopting a more chame chameleon-like approach to living on the both sides of disciplinary and professional borders and to demonstrate our willingness to engage into intentional dialogue with one another around these. So moving on, Parker Palmer, who was writing in 1987, argued that the way we know has powerful implications for the way we live. And every mode of knowing contains its own moral trajectory, its own ethical direction and outcomes. So the way we know and the things that we know influence who we are and what we do. However, there are caveats in this discussion, and this should be evident to you by now, because in the academic context, the power is often dependent and who the knower is, who the person is, who um, is regarded as being the gatekeeper or the harbinger of, the, of that particular knowledge. So for our postgraduate students, however, this has significant implications. Implications of risk. Um, the photograph that you see there is of Lucia Tieschen's um, book uh, where she explored the idea of risk in academic writing. And she has argued that even though the knowledge has powerful, has the power and the potential power to influence the way we live, this can be shortchanged can be mediated, can be held back 
Because in the process of writing, remember that currency, various experiences and modes of expression are revised or erased along the way. And this is from Thiessen's work. In the contemporary higher education landscape, this problem of erasures and silences is a deeply political issue. What forms of knowledge are being erased? What forms and what knowledges are being erased? Why? And who benefits? And who remains silent? For many postgraduate students in South Africa today, their entry into this boundary space has an additional complexity because they're entering it in a second or an even third language. This is a reality that has further implications as our students and even some of our, some of our academic colleagues as we seek to progress towards becoming an insider. Our students come to us with established identities. Our new colleagues come to us with established identities. And these can have stature within their own communities. But they may or may not prove to be enabling when they seek entry into a chosen discipline. This entry will depend or hinge on the adoption of dominant discourses. And ironically, in the quest for the scholarly voice, their own voice might be silenced. I share with you this piece from Grada Quilomba. It comes from a YouTube video, and she doesn't actually speak these words. They actually go a, a flash across the screen. And she says, I know that while I write, each word I choose will be examined and maybe even invalidated. So why do I write? I have to. I'm embedded in a history of imposed silences, tortured voices, disrupted languages, forced idioms and interrupted speeches. I write almost as an obligation to find myself. While I write, I am not the other. Remember alienation. But the self, not the object, but the subject. I become the describer and not the described. I become the author and the authority on my own history. I become the absolute opposition of what the colonial project has predetermined. I become me. These powerful words should jolt us into a realization that even as I've been speaking this evening in, in really quite a, a distant manner, almost a sterile space, this should not allow us to distance ourselves from the experience of alienation and exclusion that is very real for many of our students. And we could argue, but the students must talk back. The students must take a stand. Well, what about our PhD and master's students? Sue McKenna in her um, inaugural a couple of months ago said, and even if there is opportunity for engagement, which is what many of us work towards, few students will challenge the disciplinary hegemony that dominates. Few will attempt to rock the boat, says Sue. Postgraduate studies, especially at the level of the PhD, can be really high stakes for such rocking. As large number of postgraduate students fall, drop out of our system, or remain stuck in the system, remain stuck in the system, our, the question is to what extent are we complicit in so focusing our, our endeavors to maintain the internal coherence of our disciplines and professions that there's little space for the sort of engagement, imagination, and alignment that Wenger has argued for. Oops. So we are the custodians of our disciplines, but beware. Going back to Wenger's idea of communities of practice, he says they are born of learning, but they can also learn not to learn. They are cradles of the human spirit, but they can also be its cages. And so, what would be a response? Mignolo has argued that perhaps what we need is epistemic disobedience, students that challenge the dominant canon. And interestingly, he argues that instead of thinking of crossing the borders into the disciplinary space, that border thinking is rather, by definition, in, in its exteriority. 
And this has implications for the way we think about the conversations around decolonization and what this means for the canon that we are um, sharing with our students. Which brings me to thinking about social justice because it's an inevitable byproduct of the conversation. And I always tell my students, learning should change the way you see the world. For the MPhil students, the very first day, Meserov has spoken to this idea and far more eloquently than I, and he says, he talks about transformative learning. Transformative learning that will encourage students to question problematic frames of reference, to question their assumptions, such that our students, and I would argue indeed ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, become more inclusive. We become more discriminating about what we hear, but also open and reflective and emotionally able to change. Social justice is a national imperative. And for us in health sciences, I would argue it's inevitable, an inevitable agenda. In their Lancet Commission publication entitled Health Professionals for a New Century, Transforming Education to Strengthen Health Systems in an Independent World, <coughs> Frank Chen and colleagues have identified transformative learning as being about developing leadership attributes. Its purpose is to produce enlightened change agents. And surely this has very real implications for healing, literally healing our nation. Nancy Fraser, and I, I do her work a complete disservice by just alluding to it, but she sees social justice in the context of, of these three dimensions, recognition, hearing and acknowledging the voices of others. And Dawn, it's exactly what you spoke to this morning when we met with Professor Schoenbunkel, hearing what our students are saying. Distribution of resources and opportunities. Perhaps that's easier for us to deal with, I don't know. And then representation, legitimately being able to participate in academia's conversations. So you can hear that we're coming back full circle. So what does this mean for reframing the academic project? My focus this evening has been on uh, the way, uh, on, has been on the academic project and the development of knowledge within that context and of knowers and the way in which this development plays out across different disciplines and professions. I've argued that knowledge is powerful and that the guardians of the knowledge, the recognized knowers, the knowledge community are therefore equally powerful. And I've problematized the way in which language and discourse are not neutral, but deeply symbolic and complex. Ultimately, I've suggested that these issues can represent borders and boundaries for our students. What will this mean for us in the faculty and for the academic project? Meserov has cautioned that transformative learning is, pre is premised on students' ability to engage in critical reflection. And what he has described as critical dialectical discourse, engagement, interaction. It also assumes that our aspiring knowers can engage in the community of practice um, in a real way. Libovitz, Brenda has spoken about the idea of cognitive justice in an equal way. But this assumes a system that is prepared to evolve, to shift, to tilt, to change. In their special report on health and healthcare in South Africa in the New England Journal of Medicine, Mayosi and Benatar spoke or painted a very stark picture of healthcare in South Africa. Um, and they suggested that the complex and local, a local the complex local and global health problems require transdisciplinary socio-political economic research projects that could reframe the nature of progress and perspectives of ourselves as local and global citizens. If this is what is needed, then surely we need students who are able to engage meaningfully in these transdisciplinary socio-political economic projects. We need diversity in the system.
And we need to be able to work across disciplinary borders and boundaries. As I mentioned earlier, we need to think very carefully about what this means for healing our nation. Sorry. So what does this mean for our teaching? And I'm coming to the end. Cecilia Jacobs argued now already 12 years ago that a we need a community of practice of tertiary educators. That community needs to transcend the narrow confines of disciplinary boundaries and com the compartmentalized nature of higher education academic departments such that it will create sustainable discursive spaces where dialogue, collaboration and the development of a critical consciousness can take place in ongoing debate. Her entreaties are probably or possibly more relevant now than ever before. So currently, academia remains a strange place for many in our country. Calls for decolonizing the curriculum speak to the borders and boundaries that have been drawn around the work that we do. Rather than seeking conformity, our endeavors should be towards enabling what Cecilia has called liberating literacy for all our students and affirming different knowledges that will challenge dominant thinking and in so do take the science forward. So I leave you with this final quote from Mickelson. Who will be given social agency is both an epistemological and a political question. Whose experience of the past and whose vision of the future will be considered credible? Whose modes of testimony will be allowed to contribute to a shared understanding of the nature of the world? If we are to dream a better future, we will have to attend to practical knowledge and local wisdom. We will have to give many more people access to formal knowledge. And we will have to learn to live in a world in which both of these things are true. Thank you. <laughs>